here comes question four. And I quote, in the development of the human mind, what comes first, conscious or unconscious? Is a newborn baby capable of consciousness or does it dawn on him at some point? In other words, do you think that everything is conscious at first, then becomes unconscious because A, it becomes automatic or B, it's repressed? Or is everything unconscious at first and then some parts of the mind become conscious? As you can see, there are two questions here. Um, one of them has to do with the precedence of consciousness over unconsciousness. In other words, which comes first, conscious or unconscious? And then secondly, which is the po point I've deferred for, uh, from, from the previous question, there's this question of things becoming unconscious either because they are automatized or because they are repressed. And I'd like to deal with that, uh, with that part first because it flows from question three. I think that um, I agree with the psychoanalysts. And in fact, I myself am trained as a psychoanalyst and have experience of treating patients psychoanalytically. So I'm persuaded from my own observations, um, not only on my patients, but also on myself, uh, that there are indeed portions of our mental life that are unconscious, which are far from being automatized because we have already existing solutions. Uh, in fact, there are portions of unconscious mental life that are um, highly, problem highly problematical, uh, that represent a, a deeply unresolved conflicts and, and other problems. My view, and this is really just speculation, and uh, fortunately it's speculation of a kind that does at least in principle um, uh, admit of, uh, of uh, empirical avenues of investigation. But my view is that things become unconscious either when they are solved. The problem is solved. We have an algorithm as to what, what we need to do in this situation in order to be able to, um, in order to, be able to, have the, to achieve the, the, the outcome that, that is, that is uh, required by, uh, within the biological frame uh, that I've described already. Or they become unconscious precisely because we can't solve them. Um, let me explain. Consciousness, and this we all agree on, uh, when I say we, I mean my colleagues and I, consciousness is a very small place. Consciousness is extremely limited. Uh, the general view is that we are only able to hold seven bits of information in consciousness simultaneously at any one point in time, which incidentally is why telephone numbers tend to be seven digits long. If you think about that, you know, that you're only able to hold seven bits of information in mind at any one point in time and uh, contextualize that fact uh, with how much, how many bits of information constitute the totality of your knowledge, then you get a, 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 some sense of just how small consciousness is in relation to that portion of the mind that's unconscious. Now, if consciousness is so limited, it has to be used wisely. This leads to how I think repression works. If, you're, if you're, your consciousness is occupied, filled, as it were, with a problem that you cannot solve, an insoluble problem, then at a certain point it becomes um, inexpedient to continue to uh, um, knock your head against the wall, as it were, trying to solve something that you can't solve. At that point, I submit, we repress the material concerned. That means... We render it unconscious as if it were a solved problem, even though it's not solved. In other words, repression for me consists in premature automatization of a behavior, an attitude, uh, a mental solution to a problem that has in fact not been solved. So it's an illegitimate rendering, of un rendering unconscious of a, of a mental algorithm uh, which, which, which does not fit the bill which does not meet our needs in the world. Uh, but in order to free up this, the limited space of consciousness, we say, this thing I'm not going to think about anymore. This I'm going to treat as if the, the, the best solution I've been able to come up with, as if that is the final solution. And I render that, or, I, I render that unconscious and thereby automatize it. These illegitimate, premature, unconscious automatizations 
will then constantly bang up against reality because our predictions will not be confirmed. The outcomes that we're seeking will not come to pass. And uh, this is what leads to, um, firstly, the, the, uh, the, 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 the famous, uh, what Freud calls the risk of the return of the repressed, the pressure of repressed unconscious material constantly uh, demanding conscious attention once more. Uh, which is the same uh, thing as to say this will result in constant emotional, um, uh, uh, in affective uh, uh, consciousness. Because the affects, the feelings uh, of unpleasure when something is not uh, uh, being achieved, when an, a, a, a biologically desirable outcome is not coming about, then feelings of unpleasure will be generated. But because of the rendering automatic of the of the co cognitive algorithm, we won't know what those feelings are attached to. And so you have feelings of the kind that uh, characterize very broadly what we call psychopathology, the sorts of troubles that, that bring people to psychotherapists and psychiatrists. People don't go to psychotherapists or psychiatrists and say, doctor, I'm unconscious of something. Can you please tell me what it is? Rather, they go and say, I have this feeling that I can't cope with. Um, can you take it away? And uh, the way to take it away is to attach it once more to the cognitive uh, work that still needs to be done, that has been prematurely automatized. So that's a roundabout uh, link between questions three and four. And I now can address the, the more specific issue raised by question four alone namely the question uh, as to which comes first, conscious or unconscious. You can see from everything I've said already that, at least in part, uh, consciousness comes first. If the unconscious consists in those portions of our conscious mental life which no longer require consciousness, uh, that is to say the automatized unconscious, then clearly the automatized unconscious flows from the non-automatized conscious problem-solving processes that necessarily must precede them. Likewise, if you accept my speculations about the repressed unconscious, uh, something can only be repressed, excluded from consciousness, if it were conscious in the first place. So in both of those instances, I would say consciousness comes first, and the unconscious uh, is a byproduct of conscious uh, cognition. However, what that leaves out of account is that there are a good many um, mental processes which never become conscious in the first place. Um, so not everything that is unconscious in us has firstly been conscious. Um, there are many processes which we would call reflexive and many processes which we call autonomic. Uh, which never come to consciousness, which in fact are incapable of coming to consciousness. You cannot render conscious the, um, the um, processing uh, by your gut of, 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 the, of the food that is peristalsing along, uh, nor can you render conscious the control of the beat of your heart, um, and so on. These, auto these autonomic functions and reflexes like boom, boom, uh, boom, boom. You can't consciously control these things. So here we're dealing with processes which are unconscious from the get-go. This leads to an extremely interesting question, which is how do we decide whether or not to call these aspects of our biological functioning, whether or not to call them mental? How do you decide once you exclude consciousness from the equation, how do you decide whether an unconscious process is an unconscious mental process or not? This, I think, is a fundamentally important question. Once we accept that not all mental processes are conscious, which we evidently do, if we accept that some mental processes are automatized, some mental processes are repressed, and thereby lose the property of consciousness, then thereby accepting that some mental processes are not conscious, then what is it, by what criterion do we decide that these other unconscious mental processes, or rather I should say these other unconscious processes, such as the reflexive and autonomic ones I've referred to, what, what, what is it, uh, by what criterion do we decide whether these are mental processes or not? This problem 
leads us to what we're going to be dealing with in the course next week, in week four. I think that one of the reasons why my definition to, to, uh, up to this point of what constitutes the mental, when I said, firstly, the mental is always subjective. Secondly, I've said the mental must be capable of consciousness. Uh, that, that points to the fact that there are also mental processes which are not conscious. And this, this in turn calls out for some further criterion, some further defining um, property of the mental, which, which does not revolve around the question as to whether the process is conscious or not. So I'm not going to tell you what my thoughts are about that issue yet, because uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, uh, that's the essence of what we're going to be doing in week four. So stay tuned. Thanks very much. And thanks for the really interesting and challenging uh, and deep questions that, you, that, that you've been posting. I look forward to next week. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.